as the depleted members of the 1st Infantry Division entered the ancient city of Aachen in October of 1944, they would be met by fierce and unrelenting German resistance. Crawling through one demolished building after another as the autumn winds howled over the capital of the First Reich, the American soldiers had to fight passionate Volkssturm members who hid in the shadows waiting for an opportunity to surprise the invaders. The skirmishes would often be resolved by the side who could hurl more grenades at the enemy, or by M4 Sherman tanks leveling entire buildings. Still, after the GIs captured a pivotal property, armed civilians emerged from the floorboards to assault the invaders during the night, including women and children. It would become one of the most brutal urban battles fought during World War II by the U.S. forces. Blinded by ill-founded conviction and fear of the SS, the Germans in Aachen would resist the invasion of the symbolic city to their last breath. Symbolic Value Aachen held little tactical value to the Allied forces advancing through Germany in the summer of 1944. It had no significant military industry or military bases, so it mainly stood intact, having been ignored during previous Allied bombing raids. And even though it stood in the way of the heavily industrialized Ruhr Valley, the Allies had numerous ways of advancing without seizing the city. Nevertheless, Aachen had a significant symbolic value to Hitler and the Germans loyal to the Nazi regime. It was the ancient center of the Holy Roman Empire, what the Nazis called the First Reich, which they claimed was the precursor of their modern Nazi movement. Additionally, the 1,000-year-old city would be the first settlement besieged by Americans inhabited by ethnically German people. The symbolic value of Aachen had a profound psychological effect on the defenders, and the scale of this sentiment could not be wholly grasped by the Americans as they prepared to attack. One of the German officers defending the town would later say, quote, Suddenly, we were no longer the Nazis. We were German soldiers. The Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, under the command of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, wanted to capture the Ruhr, Germany's industrial heartland, as swiftly as possible, as that would drastically shorten the duration of the war by denying the Third Reich its ability to produce armament. Eisenhower then tasked General Courtney Hodge's First Army to break through the front near Aachen. Hodges considered that taking the city would be easy, as he was sure it was held only by a small garrison, which would quickly surrender once besieged. The general was not wrong, but there was something else. As the Allies first approached Germany's border, Aachen was lightly defended, with most of the German troops composed of militia members of the Volkssturm, many of them young boys or older men. Still, what these fighters lacked in training and armament, they made up in determination and recklessness. Hodges didn't understand the city's colossal value to Hitler and how he would do everything in his power to defend it. Setting the Stage Aachen was not entirely defenseless. Despite lying in a valley, it had the benefit of being partially protected on its flanks by the Siegfried Line, a heavily fortified defensive wall erected by the Germans to protect the Ruhr region. The defensive line was made out of thousands of bunkers, pillboxes, trenches, and machine gun nests. The Allies knew that getting past this wall would be difficult, and to avoid it, they orchestrated Operation Market Garden to circumvent the defensive wall by crossing the Rhine through the Netherlands and establishing a path for an invasion that completely ignored the primary German defenses. Still, the operation had a significant drawback. By diverting so many troops to the Netherlands and establishing pervasive supply lines, Hodges and the other forces in central Germany were left with little resources and depleted supply chains. The lack of supplies and reinforcements meant that the advance on Aachen and the surrounding region was slower and less effective than previously planned, which gave Hitler enough time to reinforce the city. The reinforcements included German Friedrich Kuckling's 81st Corps, which comprised the 183rd and 246th Volksgrenadier Divisions, and the 12th and 49th Infantry Divisions. The forces were also bolstered by the 506th Tank Battalion and 108th Tank Brigade, totaling over 20,000 men and 11 tanks. A Slow Incursion To successfully encircle the city, the 1st Infantry Division slowly advanced in a frontal direction. Meanwhile, the 3rd Armored Division attempted to go south to capture the town of Stolberg and position themselves to eventually rush Aachen from there. 
The 3rd Armored Division suddenly faced an essential section of the Siegfried Line, and the men were stunned by the intricate chain of reinforced bunkers and pillboxes, minefields, and anti-tank obstacles. Fortunately for the Americans, the heavy defenses were manned by a small force, as the bulk of the German troops were still on the Eastern Front, trying to hold back the Red Army. On September 22, 1944, the men from the 16th Infantry Regiment received a taste of the threat that lay ahead. While attempting to capture the town of Ellendor, just south of Aachen, they were met by a surprising artillery attack on a scale beyond what they thought possible. One of the soldiers described the barrage as the worst shelling of his life, even more devastating than what he'd experienced on D-Day. As the infantrymen slowly crawled into the town, they found themselves attacked by old men, women, and even children, wielding old guns and kitchen knives. Astonishingly, the Germans were able to hold back the American First Army, which lacked fuel, ammunition, and resources, and were forced to wait until October to continue the campaign. Surrounded. To prepare for the battle, the Allies unleashed a devastating shelling campaign from September 27th to October 2nd. By this time, Operation Market Garden had failed, and the Allied forces in central Germany had been resupplied. With no way to cross the Rhine through the Netherlands, the only option was through central Germany, and the Aachen region now became essential. The 30th Infantry Division began its advance on October 2nd, but the troops had to advance at a lumbering pace, taking one pillbox at a time, as most of the defenses had come out unscathed after the American shelling. Meanwhile, the 120th Infantry Regiment, the 117th Infantry Regiment, the 49th Infantry Division, and the 2nd Armored Division were able to advance from the north to the very outskirts of Aachen, where they began to engage the enemy troops in the suburbs. The entire city was now almost entirely surrounded by the Allied forces, and the town was right in front of them for the taking. Into the city. To avoid unnecessary civilian casualties, Lieutenant General Clarence R. Huebner sent a last-minute letter to the German commanders inside the city, urging them to surrender, as they were completely surrounded and outnumbered. The plea was rejected, as most of the defenders were dedicated Nazis, ready to fight for the symbolic city, and anyone who might have considered taking the Allies' offer was too afraid of the SS, who by now had taken control of the defending forces. On October 11th, the Allies launched another artillery campaign against the central city area. The idea was to avoid more brutal street fighting, like what they'd had to endure in the suburbs. The American artillery then leveled every single building within reach, leaving little shelter for the defending Germans. With nowhere to run, the defenders were forced to counterattack and try to capture the high ground around the city to end the unrelenting shelling. Still, the German offensives were weak and disorganized, and the Americans could easily repel every single one. With a large part of the city leveled, two battalions of the 26th Infantry Division were able to pierce the city limits, entering the town's dense urban center. To their surprise, they were met with heavy resistance. Urban Warfare Even though over 60% of the city lay in ruins, the Gothic architecture in the city's center proved exceptionally resilient to bombardment, and the American soldiers had to rely on door-to-door -door combat to advance. The city center was designed in a series of maze-like twisting streets and avenues, surrounded by hefty stone buildings that were hundreds of years old. To avoid being ambushed in large groups, the Americans were divided into assault platoons, each bolstered by a single M4 Sherman tank. The GIs used the tanks to destroy every building that they thought could shelter German troops. Incredibly, the cityscape was still teeming with German forces, hiding amid the ruins, the sewage system, and the building's basements. The Americans kept facing one daunting encounter after another, leaving them physically and psychologically drained, as they often found themselves fighting children, women, and old men, determined to make them pay for every inch of the city they were taking. And as the Americans made gains and established defensive posts, they would often be ambushed in the middle of the night by militiamen hiding in the same buildings that had apparently been secured. The battle quickly became a close combat nightmare, with hand-to-hand -hand combat and grenade detonations becoming the norm. Moreover, 
The Sherman tanks were also the target of the furtive militia forces, hiding behind the devastated rooftops, carrying anti-tank missile launchers and sticky grenades. Exhausted and terrified of the constant ambushes, the U.S. forces had to fight room by room and corner to corner as they slowly advanced to the very heart of the city. But as they drew closer to the headquarters of the Nazi command, the defenses became more challenging and resilient. Then, in a questionable move, the U.S. was forced to drag heavy lumbering artillery units to the city's center to tear down the reinforced Nazi positions. Counterattack On the night of October 13th, the Germans managed to sneak several hundred troops and six assault guns into the city. The reinforcements immediately responded to the Allied forces by assaulting the Nazi headquarters in the city's center. The counterattack turned into a long and intense battle that lasted for several hours, with no side achieving a definite victory. Fortunately for the Allied forces, their comrades outside the city had made a decisive push against the German troops still holding some territory to the northwest. The Allies then managed to completely surround the city in a moment that would define the battle, cutting off any possibility of German reinforcements entering the city and leaving the dwindling forces in the heart of the town to fend for themselves. By October 18th, the Allies managed to force the defending Germans into the basement of the Kellenhof Hotel, their headquarters building, thanks to artillery fire and air support. However, the last batch of elite forces taking shelter inside the hotel refused to surrender and fought formidably using sniper fire, grenades, and tactical repositioning to inflict severe damage to the Allies. It wouldn't be until the U.S. forces threatened to demolish the building that the last few German soldiers surrendered, leaving the ancestral First Reich capital in Allied hands. By October 19th, the few remaining Volkssturm forces were eliminated and the city was now a pile of rubble, with over 80% of the buildings destroyed. In total, the U.S. First Army suffered over 8,000 casualties, while the Germans sustained over 10,000. By trying to protect a symbol of Nazi ideology, Hitler needlessly sacrificed thousands of lives. Thank you for watching our video. For more thrilling military feats and the stories of the men who made them happen, click on the screen and check out our other Dark Documentaries channels. We publish new videos several times a week, so hit the bell icon to be notified of our latest content. And stay tuned for more stories.